you know, when, when I was asked to do this and I was thinking about this whole process, I think one of the really things that would come to your mind if you were w building a workshop like this, you'd really want to have, you, know, you want to get in the experts who really know about writing grants and, and what makes a successful grant writing. And I was working on this and said, oh my God, these poor people, they don't have that, they have me. <laughs> and I mean that not really to be flipped because my pathway to, 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 to this level of success, to, to have this grant, uh, required learning some really difficult lessons and, and some lessons that in many ways, I think you guys in this room are frankly ahead of me and where, where I was just a couple years ago in, in some of the mistakes I was making in grant writing, um, not necessarily for Gates, but in general. Um, and I learned some real lessons about life and science and grant writing all kind of mixed together. Um, you know, the technical aspects of the grant writing, obviously, you know, th th they're there to some degree, I think, just, just to be able to get to this point. But there's a lot we can learn. And so what I really want to do in this session for the next 40 minutes or so um, is just go over how I think about grants when looking back at my own pathway where I think I needed to learn some things and encourage you to really look deeply inside and say, gosh, maybe there's some places I can improve. There are some things that I don't do exactly right. And what is the society of science trying to tell me as I try to move on to the next level of success? So I'm going to be real honest with the things that worked out for me, the things that didn't. You'll be able to see my proposal. There's, you know, there's nothing secret in there. This is, you know, for the world and we're trying to, you know, achieve things just like you guys all are. So, um, I have a few PowerPoint slides, it's not a real formal thing, and then it, we're going to spend most of the time just going over the proposal itself, um, and, and I'll show it, and I think you have handouts, so I'll kind of show where to point, you can read it on your own or, or whatever. Ray, they have copies of this, is that right? Um, we're, we're working on getting this. We're working on it, okay, we'll have a few, you have a few minutes yet, so we're okay. Um, one thing that that I like, um, and I think it, I'm sure it's fine with the organizers, I like interactive sessions. We're a small group, so if there's something I haven't made clear, something that you'd like to ask, just shout it out. You, you won't offend me. You know, I don't know how long my material <laughs> is, quite frankly, so a little uh, discussion would be great. And then we'll have time later to, to go through a real question and answer sort of thing as well. But as we go along, please feel free to jump in. So I'm just going to start with a few kind of oops, general thoughts. Um, about grant writing and the process before we get in, into the proposals themselves. So sort of just some general thoughts about grant writing in general. You hear the term grantsmanship. I'm not sure I really like that because there's a certain gender specificity to it. But, but grant writing in general, we'll go over my phase one proposal. Um, and in looking back on that, you look at things a little bit coldly when you're preparing something like this and think, thank God I made it through phase one. I actually like the phase two proposal reasonably well. It's not a perfect document by any means, and I'll show you where I think it falls short. But the phase one, I think, is, is uh, um, could, he, could, he, could have been better. Um, and then we'll spend most of the time on the phase two. And so we'll tell the story about how I got to this point, what my thought process was, and, and um, hope that you can take some lessons away from that that you'll find useful. So some basic things. Uh, you know, at, at our institution, we have grant writing seminars. You can go and you can get kind of general platitudes and, and general things. And hopefully you've had experience with those sort of things. There's, there's resources online you can look at. Um, but I want to boil down a few of these that were meaningful to me. Um, and I think it always is helpful to really think about some very generic things. And the first thing was a lesson that I had to learn in a very hard way a few years ago. And this is the single most important thing about writing a successful grant. And I think this is where you guys all have this down pat because you're phase one grantees. Work on something important. Work on something that really, really matters to the world. And I think you guys all have that. But quite frankly, I'll show you why I think I wasn't there. And I think that was one of my really um, personal weaknesses as we went forward. Um, it's easy to fall in love with your little part of science, but in the big picture of things, is this what you want to spend the 30 or 40 years that you get to work on science? Is this what you really want to do? And I think that's where you guys are really ahead of me. Um, one thing that I'd like for you guys to think about, and it sort of ties in, the, in with the previous one, is make sure you believe in what you're doing. Um, and in thinking about preparing a phase two proposal, Quite frankly, if we brought in everybody who had a phase one, there are probably some people who need to hear this. 
um, quite frankly, these are forward-looking, speculative sort of proposals. We wouldn't expect that everything has turned out like we would hope, right? So do you still believe in your project? Do you think this is the place you want to go? Hopefully, you know, you're here. Hopefully, your projects have been going well. But remember, if you get this phase two, this is going to be what you think about day and night for the next two years and probably going on. This is going to set up years and years of your career. So make sure that you really think that this is something that's critical and that you still believe in. All right, we're going to spend a lot of time as we go through the proposals in thinking about making your case, telling your story. Some of my mentors have said, can you make your reader cry? Well, that's a little bit of exaggeration, but exaggeration also brings out truth, right? That you want to convince your readers that what you are telling them is incredibly important. Now, not only that is it important, but maybe your reviewers, even at this stage, may have a couple hundred incredibly important things, right, that they're looking at. What is it that's unique about your proposal? What is it about what you're doing that um, stands out? How are you uniquely positioned not only to have a critical problem, but to really bring together that right team, that right set of technologies at the right time to be able to address that? Are you really where Mr. Gates or Canada or whoever should invest their limited resources? Okay, so you want to make that case because you believe in what you're doing. All right. I'm going to try to stand right here, so if you guys can't see, <laughs> I, I don't. Want, I want to try not to move around too much. So um, anyway, I will be here. So uh, act appropriately. Um, one thing that that can just totally derail you is basic mistakes in grant writing. Okay, so there's a ton of them. We'll hit upon them. I don't have them all listed here. Um, we'll show some examples in, in my grants where I think I was guilty of a few of them. Um, but basic things that can derail you. Follow the format. You know, I, I tell my 11-year-old son this, follow directions at school, right? And then I go out and write a grant and I didn't do that myself. Well, that doesn't work. Okay, fill out the forms, get things in on time. All basic stuff that, that you know, you guys are successful, you don't need to hear that. But unfortunately, in some of the people that I mentor back home, they fail on these points. And then they wonder why they're not successful. Basic stuff. Get things proofread. Now, I grew up, English was my first language. Um, English has become the language of science. You guys are writing these in English. Some of you, many of you, English is not your first language. Get these things proofread. I get these things proofread myself, okay, all the time. I've written God knows how many pages of grants and papers in my career, as all you have. And I still make mistakes because we're, we're human beings, right? We're fallible. We'll make mistakes. Don't believe you can get everything right. Don't be embarrassed to send it out. Don't be embarrassed to send your drafts out to people. Get as much feedback as you can because we are smarter than me. Okay? And we are smarter than you. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, all right? So get that help from your colleagues because my experience is your colleagues want you to succeed because they're good people and they want science to move forward. So find people who can help you. Another point that I'll make throughout the proposals as we work through these things is provide sufficient detail in your proposal that people really know what you're doing. And, and I'll show this more in concrete, but I just want to hit this and get your mind thinking about it. One mistake that I see, uh, especially younger people make, is they'll have a, a, a wonderful um, uh, goal in, the, in their research, very, very important, no one would argue with. They may even make a very compelling case for why this needs to be addressed and sort of how and sort of the general ideas of what will happen. And then they get to the proposal and it's very, very unclear what they're actually going to do. I sit on study sections for the National Institutes of Health at the, uh, in the United States, and we see the same thing. People have spent, you know, these are long proposals, right? People write 10, 15 pages on these things, and you don't really know what they're going to do. What are the experiments? Now here, you're going to have about two pages to do this, right? Or now in this, you're going to have five pages. Not a lot of time. You're going to have to be concise, but it still shouldn't be unclear uh, and I see these grants that they don't have an experiment in them, okay? So what are you going to do? Provide enough detail so that, w that the reviewer will understand what are you going to do, what resources are available to you, what reagents, do you have those reagents, do you have a source, a collaborator for these things? Um, 
if you've had some successes, make sure that they're in there. So that we bring things from the abstract to reality. Okay, we want to make these things as, as real as possible for the reviewers. Critically important, be realistic about what you promise. So, you know, everybody was successful in, in achieving a phase one grant, and a little bit that this story is told for each of you. You have promised something, predicted something in your phase one proposal, okay? You said, I am going to address this problem, I'm going to do, take this approach, do these experiments, and at the end of this one year, I am going to have this. And to some degree, this is telling you this a little late, <laughs> because the ideal situation for you to be now, and what I think really was probably the single biggest secret of my success, is that I found just the right nugget of work to say, this is what we will do in year one, and if we succeed at that, it will demonstrate that the approach is useful and the experiments in phase two can take us closer to that goal. Not take us to that goal. I mean, listen to what we're trying to do in this room, right? You know, we'll talk about, I'm trying to cure HIV. You're trying to prevent malaria. You're, you're, you know, you're trying to develop, these things don't happen in two years, okay? And these folks, from, these are sophisticated people we're dealing with. They understand that, right? But they also understand time is limited for people who are afflicted with these maladies. We need to move forward fast and we need to have benchmarks. Are we moving forward or are we not? So if you're at that situation where you have now achieved your goals in phase one and you're ready to move into phase two and you can package up a reasonable thing that takes this now from, you know, you've, you've been at the total speculation phase. Now you're at that, hey, this looks pretty darn promising phase. And that's, that's the perfect spot to be right now. But think now in the future, in two years, I'm at the, yeah, this thing is really, you know, really looks like it's gonna go forward. We know what we need to do to get there. You know, the, the, the next phase is the springboard to reality, okay? And look, I've, I've spoken a lot with these folks. We all know not, not all of these are gonna work. In fact, the expectation f from the foundation is the majority of these are not going to work. Okay, that's that is the point of this uh, of, of of this effort, um, but you're wasting your money. They're wasting their money if at the end of two years you can't say, "Yeah, this is looking like it's going forward," or "No, it isn't." Thank you. You know, we all tried in good faith, and now we move on to a new thing. Okay, and that's what happen is happening in, at the end of phase one. That's what will happen at the end of phase two as well. Okay. And then a really critical thing, know your funder. I sort of alluded to that just now. This is critical for any grant writing. This is critical for any paper writing you do. This is critical for, you know, you try to get a faculty job, you want to change it, you know, know who you're dealing with. So let's think about uh, Grand Challenges Explorations. Think about Grand Challenges Canada, the Gates Foundation. Um, very, very similar organizations. So I'm going to sort of lump these things together. Um, so here now, I, I see if I step on any toe. These are, these are my perceptions uh, of, of these folks. They're all smiling at me. What will he say? A strong focus on the big problems, okay? So I already said that was important. You know, I had to be hit over the head with this. I mean, I did science for 15 years, probably working on things that I shouldn't have been, quite frankly. Um, and so this was a great thing um, for me as I was sort of making a transition to what I thought were some really important problems. To have a foundation like, for me, the Gates Foundation to say, hey, this is what we want. That was like, that was perfect. That's what I needed to hear. Hey, maybe I'm thinking along the right lines, okay? So Gates is helping you do that. And you're, you know, you're all phase one awardees, so you're all set. A focus on issues relevant for global health. Again, you're all set there. Things like malaria, things like HIV, things that, that, that affect people throughout the world, um, and especially you know, in lower and middle income countries. So those are generic. Um, but now let's think about things that are maybe a little more subtle. The foundation is an incredibly collaborative organization. You would have had to have done nothing other than sit in the introduction before I got up here to understand that this is a very collaborative organization. I mean, how many times did people say, we're partnering with, we're reaching out to, we've been working with? 
throughout the world, right? And this comes from the very top, you know, when, when, when Mr. Gates, you know, Mr. Gates is, deals with the entire world, right? You know, this is part of business. This is why Microsoft is so successful. This is, this is the way of the future. The world is flat, right? And this is what's, you know, given, you know, this is, this is what's given the great opportunity that you guys all have opportunity and it's not just m me and, you know, and my colleagues from, you know, from the north, as somebody said, that now everybody has these opportunities, right? And so a highly collaborative organization that in turn is looking for that from their grantees, okay? Now I don't know that they necessarily have ever told me this, but I'm here for you. And I can say that the more that you, as an applicant, are showing that you have connections. You are working with other people. You recognize when there's an expertise that you don't have, that you're reaching out to somebody else who can provide that and building a team that's stronger than the sum of its parts, then your application is going to be looked on much more favorably, okay? Not only that, look, this isn't all just about getting the grants right. That's an important component, but what's the goal? The goal is to successfully address these problems. And you know, I can't speak for you, but I know that I'm not smart enough to deal with all the problems that are in what I'm trying to do. I'm not even close. Now, I do have a vision for what we can do, and, and I have reached out enough now that I understand what is the team we need to build. And you guys all need to be thinking along those lines, okay? And regardless of what happens in your phase two proposal, that's going to help your career, all right? A basic lesson, you guys probably don't need to hear that, but if there's, you know, one or two people here who need to hear that, then that's very, you know, then it's worth the time. Uh, another critical point is that the selection process is not consensus driven. So, you know, if you, if you listen to, um, you know, Chris Wilson talking about the grand challenges, explorations, you know, conceptually, or, or you know, any of the folks who were involved in setting this up, th there are many funders in the world, and especially for folks like you know the National Institutes of Health, my colleagues in Europe, and you know you all have your, your national governments that support the research. So, in looking for something that was different, what could the foundation do that was unique? And and, and what they came up with was the idea of funding highly speculative work, it's work that had very very high promise of addressing these critical problems, but also was very very high risk. So things that would be very, very difficult to get funded. I mean, I will very proudly say that the work that you're about to see from me would have never, ever gotten funded from the National Institutes of Health. Now it's in review actually today, <laughs> um, literally today, uh, at the National Institutes of Health that, you know, for some of the future stuff as we start to move forward into starting to take these things into to animals and then people. Um, but, um, now we have a lot of data, right? Now you can start to get consensus. Oh, this looks very promising. But with just a concept, there is no way. So you know this, but you can take this to your advantage still in your phase two, right? That you don't need to um, write in a defensive manner. Uh, you know, what do we do in consensus-driven research? We avoid speculative things. We avoid risk. We avoid anything that's more than just, you know, the next tiny, tiny, incremental improvement from the last one. Here's where we want to be bold, right? You know, you're going after these big problems. It's okay that there's still some questions, some unanswered issues. You don't have to have all the answers yet. You, ha you hopefully have had some good results and some promise, but don't be afraid to be bold here, okay? All right, so a um, little bit of background in my phase one, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a quick look at that and then go into the proposal. So I was doing work like this, and, and this is what I was saying, we won't go through this, but you know, I was working on virus-host interactions and, and viral mechanisms by which the immune system is, 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 is usurped. And we were doing, uh, I think, good, technically good work. We published in, in, in reasonable journals like the Journal of Immunology and Journal of Virology, and things were good. But I was having a very hard time keeping my lab funded. I mean, it was a struggle, and I, I was mechanically, I think, a reasonably good writer. Um, and I started to wonder, why am I struggling? Why am I struggling? And this is what came up to I realized that if I was trying to explain to my father-in-law what I was doing, I was, oh, there's a signaling pathways and the virus usurps that and that may be how it uh, delays the immune response such that it can get a head start, a replication, and I'm waving my hands pretty soon. And 
you know, my father-in-law was a, you know, he was an old pilot, you know, so he doesn't know anything about science particularly, but he'd say, so, oh, yeah, so what are you going to do with that? <laughs> I said, oh. You know, and, and so this is my embarrassing, you know, like I get up and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a reforming dabbler in unimportant stuff. Uh, um, you know, I needed to really learn, work on the important things. And so what happened for me was that this article came up in 2007. It's, it's our little newspaper at our institution, and it was from some colleagues who were working on genetic therapies, and they were working on um, some mechanisms by which you could um, essentially try to correct a, a gene from, from a genetic defect right at the site. You know, not, so not just put in a transgene somewhere randomly, but actually fix it right at that site. And I started looking at that and, and asking around about the technology, and they have these things that I think are up here somewhere called homing endonucleases. Oh, they're there somewhere. So we'll talk about those. And that's where it really came to me that we could use these things to address viral infections. And then I suddenly realized, wow, you know, maybe instead of saying, oh, my reviewers are stupid, you know, they don't get my research, maybe I should be working on something where I can, you know, when my father-in-law asks me what I'm doing, he goes, oh, I'm trying to cure AIDS. Okay, you know, it's like, well, what the hell, you know, <laughs> big problem, but why not, you know, flounder at something that's incredibly important, right? And along the way, we're going to learn a lot of stuff, and I figure at the end of the day, you know, worst case, I'm going to be publishing papers in Journal of Immunology and Journal of Virology, and, you know, if we don't cure AIDS, well, what the heck, you know, but why not, why not try to achieve something? So that was, that was sort of the background. So I'm going to give you three minutes or so on the background of my project, not because I want to give you a science talk, I just want to give you a sense about what I'm doing so that you'll have a little context for the proposal itself. And, and this is just an introduction slide that I give now when I'm talking to a group who, you know, whether they know much about HIV or not. As I mentioned, HIV is the problem that, that we were addressing. And in, in the first round of, of, of the grand challenges, one of the, one of the topic areas was new approaches to cure HIV infection, which just came out at, at a perfect time for me because I had just come up with this thing and I thought, well, they're looking for speculative stuff. I have absolutely no data. I have this idea. Um, it's two pages, right? <laughs> Did you guys all go through something like this, right? It's like, well, why not? It paid off pretty well, right? Well, HIV is actually, if you think about it, a really unique problem in viruses. It's a unique problem because it gets into the body of the infected person and then it hides somewhere, right? I mean, it's, it's unlike a lot of other viruses. It actually hides in places. And I have a lot of colleagues who think about where it goes. It goes to certain tissues right in the body, maybe the gut-associated lymphoid tissue or other places. And it goes to certain cells in the body. So we think about memory T cells or things like this. But you know, where it really goes, right? I mean, the, the real critical thing is it hides somewhere in these chromosomes, right? So the virus is in here and it integrates. It puts itself in there, so you've got this haystack, and somewhere in there is a needle, and it's HIV, and because it's hiding in there, there's absolutely no way that you can go through this thing, find it, and do anything about it. It's part of the human being now, and that's why this is an incurable infection. There is no hope of doing that. And the point of my proposal, and the point of our work ever since, um, has been, in fact, that now we used to think about this as something that there's no hope for, but in fact now there is technology that allows us to go through this entire haystack, look through every, every sequence, base pair after base pair, billions of base pairs, ultimately find the integrated provirus, cut it, and destroy it. Okay, so that technology exists, and that is the, the fundamental part of my work. And so the, 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 the technology are these proteins called homing endonucleases, um, these are proteins, they, they, they're part of a selfish genetic element in yeast, but what they fundamentally do is recognize a long DNA sequence, 22 nucleotides, and if they find that, they induce a double-strand break. Now in yeast, th that's perfect for a selfish genetic element because of the way yeast repair or do DNA repair, but in mammalian cells, um, these double-strand breaks get repaired by non-homologous end joining. So basically the two ends just get put back together, okay? And so that restores the same sequence that we always had. But if this enzyme's there, what happens is you get cleavage again, repair and cleavage and repair, until what happens is a mutagenic repair mechanism by which the two ends get lost and you get a deletion, okay? So if we were able to take these things and change them from the yeast sequences that they recognize, such that they would recognize viral sequences, then we could search through the whole genome, find the viral sequence, cleave it, lop out a big chunk of that virus and leave it as a dead shell of a virus, 
Okay? And that's the fundamental idea for what we're doing. And the critical technology, the enabling technology, is in fact all my colleagues were developing the technology that allowed us to change the specificity to what we want. Because they wanted to you know, treat X-link immunodeficiency or something. Uh, they weren't thinking about viruses. And in fact, what they were finding is it's very, very hard in a mammalian cell to induce a double-strand break and then stick something in there. They were getting these deletions. And for me, that was fabulous because that's exactly what we want. So their misfortune was our fortune if we were thinking about viruses. All right, so that's the background. That's what we're wanting to do. Are there any questions or comments at this point or we'll just jump straight into the proposals? Okay, great. So it looks like Ray's got the uh, copies now. <laughs> so uh, while Ray is handing out the um, new one, All right, so this is my phase one application. I'll just show this for a little bit of context um, because there's a couple of lessons here that, I, that I'd like to get across to you guys, or you know, lessons is a bad term, things that are from my experience that might be helpful to you. Um, so I actually, in looking back at this, don't think this is especially well written. I think it's okay, and obviously it was good enough to get funded because the idea was compelling. Um, you know, we're, we're going to try to make a case for, for why curing HIV is a problem. You don't really need to do that too much because, you know, th they've announced a PA, you know, <laughs> they want an application for this. Why is this a compelling approach? Um, you know, this is, uh, I spent some time arguing on this. But what I did want to show you, so I actually spent, you know, the first, entire first page basically generically talking about the approach. Um, why I thought that this was different from what anybody else had done and why it actually offered, you know, I think one of the few realistic possibilities of curing this infection where you could at least list the roadblocks between where you are and where you need to be, that, 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 that you knew what the problems were. But the lesson here um, is when I got into the viscity to what you want is a difficult problem. It still is three years later. Um, at the time I wrote this, almost three years ago, it was an even bigger problem. And so this was fairly forward looking. You know, it, we, people were working hard on that. There'd been some very high profile papers and changing things. Um, so I was pretty sure it could be done, but I realized I couldn't, couldn't possibly do that in year one. So what I proposed to do instead was to say, let's just prove that if we had one of these things that could recognize an integrated retrovirus, it could find the retrovirus, it could attack it, it could disable it. So even though we weren't too good at redirecting them at the specificities at the time, what my lab and, and myself were really good at is changing viruses. So phase one was all about simply making a virus that had the recognition site for an existing homing endonuclease. So I took a virus and put the yeast sequence into it so that it could be cleaved and then made latently infected cells with that virus and simply asked, what happens? If I introduce the homing endonuclease, do I get that cleavage? Is the virus disabled? Okay? And fundamentally, that worked incredibly well. You know, right? This is my speculative you know, thing. I'm trying to change what my lab does. I have no idea if any of this is going to work. And in basically our, our second experiment, this worked beyond our wildest dreams. The virus got knocked out incredibly efficiently, you know, and, and we were able to you know, sequence it and show that we had deletions and knew the size. So, you know, fantastic success. But in looking back, none of how we actually did that is what I said we were going to do here. <laughs> and so you guys have already given me the face too, so I can confess now. <laughs> you know, but, but actually, that's a little bit of a joke. But, it's, it, but you know, it's OK that science is a moving target. Yes? But the point about that is, but you actually said that and addressed it. Yes. You, what, didn't, what he promised in his phase one, he didn't do it exactly that way. Mm -hmm. But this is why. Yep. Because it's, not, it's, a, it's a thing about, you promised this, but you send me this, but you don't show me why you've changed or, or, exactly. or what the rationale to change it is. You know, 
mm -hmm. as a reviewer, your guess is, well, yeah. it didn't work, so he's doing a bait and switch. Uh -huh. Yeah, so one would think that, and, and I had the, the luxury of having achieved the fundamental goal of the project, absolutely, okay? But in a, in a slightly different way, because as we started to do things, we realized this isn't working. The DNA repair mechanisms were, quite frankly, working a little differently than we expected. Some things that are unforeseeable, Expect that to happen. Expect that you're continuing to work toward your overall goal and address these things, okay? And, and I think that's okay, just like Ling was saying. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. The, suppose uh, you design your homing endonucleases mm -hmm. based on certain viral identification motifs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this virus uh, maybe in an, uh, has changed in an individual like in the C, there are sequences of B which have inserted itself as it often happens in Northeast India. Yeah. So, how how will you, how many will you have to design, and also considering quasi species which you have. Thank you so much. This illustrates a great point. I'll answer your question scientifically, and I'll use it to illustrate a point. Talk to smart people about your work because they ask incredible questions. You know who else asked me that question was Mr. Gates. Asked me that very same question. Talk to smart people. You don't always have to be scientists, uh, you know, <laughs> biologists. Um, yeah, so a big problem. There's tremendous genetic variability in HIV. There's tremendous genetic variability within a given individual, right, that their virus actually mutates within that. So we've spent a lot of time in, in talking with folks. We actually thought about that ourselves too, but, but that comes up a lot. When you hear that, address that in your proposal. So the proposal, which I'll show you when we get to phase two, we have analysis of conservation, we have an algorithm for how we find the sites that we're looking for on the basis of conserved sites, and then we actually have modeling that says, because no site is perfectly conserved, in a given individual, how many homing endonucleases would you need to use within a given individual? And in fact, so we have that all modeled, and we'll actually be publishing that actually next month. Um, um, so it's a critical question, so thank you very much. The answer is probably we'll need between four and six homing endonucleases per individual. Um, and, you know, and some of that's based on the assumption, and we'll actually test that as we go into some small animal and then primate models uh, to make sure that our estimate's correct. So we're making a, a, a hand, you know, a quiver of these things. Um, Can I ask, so did yes. you get a lot of the same types of questions when you talked about your project? Yes. And so, you know, I wanted to talk to enough smart people so that I started to have a, you know, a statistically valid <laughs> impression of what do people ask. Because the reviewers are smart people too, and they're on average going to ask, you know, if this keeps coming up, this question comes up a lot. It's a critical question. It's, it's probably one of the two critical questions to this, okay? And we'll get to the other one later on and why, why that's not in my proposal, actually. Um, but, um, you know, if you talk to enough people, you start to see what comes up over and over. And sometimes it's the one from left field you haven't heard before, right? And you go, oh my gosh, yeah. And so it's not only for your grant writing, it's for the project, right? You know, if you haven't thought about this, so what did I do? I ran out, I got the smartest people who worked on conservation of HIV. So, who, you know, so you think, who is that? Who, who am I going to talk to? I went and found vaccine people, right? Because vaccine people deal with the same problem. Now, they deal with it at the amino acid level. But I said, hey, you've got all this conservation stuff. Can you do that on nucleotides too? I said, oh yeah, absolutely, you know, give me, give me a day. You know, you find that collaboration. Now, am I gonna go out and learn how to do conservation? You know, that's not my thing. But, I, but we realize that's a critical question. And so we find the right people to help us with that, okay? So. Is that generated by you? Or is that something that <coughs> just happened? How, how did you start to do that? Or was that something you just knew how to do? To find those people? That was something that I, that I had come to realize was critically important. It goes back to this whole thing about, you know, being collaborative, having those connections. And, um, you know, no one person is an island at this. And, and, and these things are so complicated. Everything that you're trying to do here is so complicated that you simply can't do it all yourself. You need colleagues. And even if you... you you know, I mean, there's the, there's the odd example of the, of the crazy loner scientist, but boy, that's a, you know, that's almost a fiction in, in today's world. You know, maybe not absolutely. I'm sure that if we looked hard enough, we could find an example of somebody who really doesn't collaborate and, and does well. But, 
you know, Could I ask don't you bet. A, your father-in-law kind of question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> suppose, suppose you succeed. Uh -huh. You have a set of uh, homing endonucleases which works. Uh -huh. uh, what are the regulatory roadblocks which you will face? Have you thought about that? If you want to convert it into a product? Um, we've thought about that some. Um, you know, the, the, the regulatory issues will be very difficult. Um, I will tell you we have programs not only in HIV, uh, we have programs in hepatitis B now and also herpes simplex. It's interesting there are different regulatory aspects for all of those. Um, certainly for HIV, um, it's a life-threatening, obviously, condition in the absence of, of you know, continual therapies. Um, hepatitis B certainly is as well, you know, for, for herpes simplex in general it's not. Um, so I think that, you know, w we intend to take a very stepwise progression of this through small animals, through primates, and then ultimately, you know, in our institution we have the ability to go to human trials if it's warranted. Um, but I don't kid myself, I think it'll be a very, very long, long process. So we'll need to look at safety, we'll need to look at off-target effects, we'll need to look at you know, is there any induction of, of tumor genesis? I mean, you know, th these are things. So I think the safety, the safety studies will be slow and they will be extended um, for that, okay? Now we do have an advantage again in that remember that there are people working on these same things to, to cure genetic diseases as well. And so much of the safety studies, again, we're able to piggyback on some of the things that they're doing. If somebody gets a little ahead of us, in vivo work, we can start to look at some of their safety stuff and say, well, you know, it's been safe so far. Those things can go into our grants, right? These have been expressed in animals now for, you know, six months, and the animals show no evidence of any genotoxicity. You know, they're not only are they not sick, but you can't detect that they're cleaving something they shouldn't. So those sorts of things are very helpful. So again, it goes back to this idea of, of, of you know, working with folks. I think, Keith, there's a point there also about collaboration and who you define as collaborators, right? So typically you would think of, if you're in malaria, you look for someone else who's also in malaria or in a field that's right next to yours. But in your case, it's actually someone orthogonal. Oh, absolutely. And it's actually someone else who's got a different point of view or different, maybe even work in a different total area, but you work on a similar type problem from a different perspective. So what you define or who you look for as mm -hmm. collaborators probably could be broad. It should definitely be as broad as possible that you know your collaborators who bring a unique skill to you that you don't have that's what a collaborator does and that's what is so fun I mean in this project I've worked with these mathematical you know sequence analysis conservation people I've worked with folks who do mathematical modeling you know they turn the computer on and let it run for three days and, and you know model these infections you know in a, in a stochastic manner um, to see what would happen with multiple homing endonucleases. It's fascinating. Work with crystallographers and folks who, you know, do computer-aided design. It's, 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 it's teamwork. And they absolutely c could never come up with a way to address a viral infection, you know, without me. And I couldn't do this without them. And that's the point of collaboration. So never, never limit yourself. You know, and never be afraid to just talk to somebody cold. Now I ask around, right? If I truly don't know somebody in the field that I want, I play, do you guys know the game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon? Is that something, you know, where you, you figure out so-and-so was in a movie with this person and they were in a movie with this and this and you get to this other actor named Kevin Bacon and you can do it in six jumps or like everybody in the world, you know, is only six degrees apart from somebody. So you can do that in science, right? That, okay, I have to find as an example, away from this, I needed to find somebody who did small animal models for hepatitis B, okay? Now, I looked around Seattle, there's nobody who did that. You know, I didn't, I didn't do that. You know, I knew, I know the literature, so who are they? So, you know, you look up, who are the people? There's a couple, right? Um, you know, there's a group in, you know, I think, Princeton, and then there's a fellow in Canada, and, and you know, in, 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 you know, a European group. Well, then you start to ask around, hey, you know, I talked to my Hep B folks, right? Who do you know? You know, have you worked with so-and-so? And you find out who's a good collaborator, right? You know, who, who plays well with others, right? I mean, you want to have a health, you want this to be fun, right? You know, I mean, collaborations can, if you get in with the wrong person, it can be miserable, right? So you want to get in people you can trust, people who care about the science first, you know, just going to help and work together. 
do your due diligence. It doesn't take a long time. It takes a couple hours, right? A couple of phone calls, call your friends, find out. And then you get somebody, and usually when you find that person, then they're super excited because you've already vetted that they like to collaborate, right? They're excited. You've got a great project. All your projects are great. You go, and you know what? Take advantage. You go, I got this Gates Foundation grant. You know, <laughs> they, they listen to you, right? You know, and look, whatever happens in phase two, hey, you're, you're a Gates Foundation grantee. You know what? You're going to ride that for a while, okay? You know, so you talk to people, they're going to listen to you because this is validated what you do, okay? So, gosh, <laughs> I'm really going long. We'll take, we'll take a break here in a couple minutes, I think. Let's get through the phase one, and then we'll go to the phase two. And so anyway, I just love this. I don't want to belabor this point, but... Um, we wanted to, this is an example of, I said things changed, but, but, but listen to how they changed, right? So I wanted to make a, a target cell, lightly infected cell that has this virus in it that, that I can cleave with my existing homing endonuclease, just to see what happens. So originally I was going to put it in using this flip-in system with flip recombinase. You know, in retrospect, we actually started this, we realized this is a touch a little bit, but if we look at the overall theme for what we were trying to accomplish in phase one, we had done it. And so, you know, we knew at that point we were going to be pretty competitive for phase two. Okay? All right. Do we want, we were scheduled to take a break at 1030, I think. I think it's pretty flexible. I mean, do you want to go through it, walk through so then people in the break can look at your work? Is everybody doing okay? I mean, can we, can we go on? Okay, great. Um, rest at your table while I find my uh, proposal because I got myself disorganized here. Let's see, grants. All right, so here's the phase two proposal. You guys have this. Um, I, I, I think that there are actually some better things in this. Overall, I think it's better written. Um, and, and, you know, in looking back at this one, at least being how far we are into it, about six months. So far we seem to actually be doing, in this case, what we said. So I think, you know, w w you can see that we actually started to get a better sense about the science of this, and this is what you would expect. So now we're actually, uh, the approaches seem to be the right ones that we proposed. Um, so we'll just go through this, um, and, and then uh, during the break, you guys can, you can, can look at things, then we'll go through this. So the first thing, we're just going to set up sort of the problem. Um, so, you know, HIV is an enormous problem throughout the world. Um, we want to emphasize kind of what is the need um, within, this, uh, within this field. So the need is for some sort of cure, right? So that will make an enormous, enormous difference. Um, and so in the introduction here, this is the part where I'm, you know, trying to make people cry. And I don't make anybody cry, but I want, you know, people to appreciate that there's an enormous need for curative therapy for HIV. So we're going to talk about, you know, there's, there's a tremendous need. People have tried some things to cure HIV. They've tried to flush the reservoir with cytokines. It's, it's just been abysmally, you know, it's just not been successful at all. And so the case that I'm trying to make here is that, in fact, what we really need to do is go after the integrated retrovirus itself in a directed way. So here I'm setting up the problem and in an abstract a potential approach that's going to work um, that basically leads the reader, what I'm trying to do is lead the reader into saying, gosh, I wish we had a reagent that could just find HIV itself, you know, the integrated provirus, where now I can come in, in the next paragraph and say, hey, we have these things and they're homing endonucleases and this is the game changer in HIV because now we actually have this reagent that can find the integrated provirus and do something about it. Okay? It's never existed before, and that's what makes the time ripe to actually do this kind of work. Okay? So I mentioned this idea of adding details in. You know, you don't want to gloss over things. So actually go through a little section here. You'll see about what are homing endonucleases, how do they work, how is repair. You know, t space is short in here, but I'm trying to get across. They recognize a long sequence. They're very, very specific. They won't cleave other places. They'll make a double strand break, and then we'll get a deletion around it. Okay, so those four quick concepts here in just one paragraph. Um, and then basically what, what, what we want to do then is sort of get to a point where as we get to the end of the introduction, the reader almost 
knows what you're going to propose, right? That you've set this problem up and the technology that it, it almost seems obvious that now the answer is right there, okay? Um, a couple things I'll just point out that you'll see. Um, let's see, where are we? Let's go down a little bit. So you'll see that you know, it has a structure which is a little bit unusual, at least a different sort of um, way of doing a grant compared to an NIH grant. But again, this is following the directions, right? This is, this is what you know, this group wants. So I've got you know, the goals, very concise. Um, and this sort of gives me a chance, you'll see this over and over, you know, the successful phase one. I really want to hit, you know, if you've had success, you've achieved your goals in phase one, be sure to say that, you know, we achieved our goals, this is still promising. Because what you want to have is a situation, right, where you say, well, you want your reviewer to say, well, gosh, if we thought this was worth funding at the beginning, and everything worked, <laughs> You know, if we aren't going to fund it now, why did we bother funding it at the beginning? Okay, you want to you want to put these Gates folks in that bind, or these you know Grand Challenges Canada folks in this bind to say, gosh, these people are successful at this great thing that they're promising. You know, we we have to fund this. <laughs> this is where you want them to be, right? Okay. Um, so an interesting point. Just mm -hmm. to comment on that is that it's almost like a story you're telling me, right? You know, you're kind of leading me through exactly. Your experience, and I'm sort of in your, your participant experience, I mean, what I'm really trying to do, <laughs> I'm almost trying to manipulate you <laughs> into your mindset of where I want you to be, that, that you have, you know, you're coming around, you're focused on this problem, whatever the one that, that, you know, these guys think is so important, understanding where they're coming from, you know, maybe the idea is so unique that you're the only person who could thought of it or, or could, 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 you know, could even conceive of it, but another strength that you can potentially, you know, put into your proposal is, why you are uniquely positioned, uniquely able to do this, okay? So for us, you know, and, th and this is not BS, I mean, you really need to think about this, right? You wanna be working on things that are important and that, you know, won't get done if you don't do them, right? I mean, if somebody else is gonna get it done two weeks after you, you know, you, you, know, you can take whatever you want out of that. So, you know, what I'm gonna try to make the, the point here is that and this is an example where I didn't do it very well, quite frankly. You know, I said, oh, there's all this, you know, knowledge now that exists and, and we're good at molecular biology. And that was actually pretty lame. In fact, we're one of the few places in the world that could actually do this. You're going to do the right experiments, hopefully. You know, I mean, talk with people. Like, I do. I, this is another thing about getting it vetted. I make, hey, am I doing this right? You know, talk to smart people. Talk to other people. Um, but you've got you to gotta have them wanting to fund you by here. Okay. Um, so let's see, let's go down just a little bit. So here I start to talk about we're going to bring together a team of experts in these different things. And so, you know, this goes back to teams and, and, and collaborations and, and, you know, what really is a strength of this. But again, I don't think I made it as quite as well as I could. All right, so we mentioned details. And I just, I'm just going to give you a general sense of that we achieved this, I think, and I think this section is pretty good, actually, that, um, you know, we want to choose, we want to spend some time choosing what we're going to target. So we want to look at two things. We want to look at what can be engineered, and so they're going to be sites that are close to the native site for this wild-type enzyme that exists, um, and they have to be conserved. So we're going to show how do we choose them just based on what we can engineer toward. So what's close to, the, you know, what sequences in HIV are close to the yeast sequences, basically. And then we're going to get at this whole question about, uh-oh, what did I do? There we go. And then this is your question exactly. So conservation. So what's conserved between HIV isolates? What is has sites that are close in the human genome? This is another question that comes up a lot. Well, will you have our target effects? You know, the human genome is really big. And so I have a lot of stock answers. To this. One thing is that if you take a random length site, once it's longer than 17, it's unlikely to exist in the human genome. That's sort of the magic number, okay? So these things recognize 22, so they're bigger than that. This is why you can't use a restriction enzyme, because <laughs> it would just cut the human genome into a bunch of pieces, because it's six or eight base pairs. So we address those things in here quite in detail. Um, so and, and point to ask about is the mm -hmm. structure for this section about the project plan. Can mm -hmm. you, how did you think about how to structure that? Because I'm seeing yeah. sort of the a and a 
activity. Yeah. Walk me through. Sure. You Thank you. Yeah. So, um, well, this came out uh, to a large degree, again, uh, uh, from the instructions for this, that they wanted a set of, of major objectives and activities. I mean, I think that these are taken right out of the, you know, requests for proposals as they were done. And then they wanted sub-objectives within that. So these are basically, um, you'll see there are two major objectives um, in this, kind of an A and a B, and then each one has a number of objectives within that. These are the steps that we need to take. And each one sort of is an activity, has a set of experiments within it, and sort of a, you can think of it as a yes or no, did it work, successful, you know, and da, 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 here we have to go through them. And it gives, you know, it gives a structure. I like strong structure in what I write, and you'll, you'll just see this. If you look in my papers, it'll be, you know. Um, some people like a more flowing prose, and that can work for people. Um, I just like a strong organization on it. So, so you'll see that very strong on this. But it was requested in, in the request for proposals. Um, I should mention, well, we'll come back to that a little bit about the structure as we get to the second major objective. Um, and, and we'll talk about um, some great feedback that I got from the foundation, actually, in, in, in working out the final version for this. All right. Yeah, so I want to just point out one thing down here. So this is this off-target problem. And, and just to reiterate, it's important as you think about what are the potential objections that come up to this. And so an off-target effect is a big one. Go ahead and address that. You know, don't, never try to sneak anything through. You know, they, maybe they won't think of it. They will think of it, you know, because we're all skeptics as scientists, right? So be ready to address it, okay? And you know what, if you can't address it, you know, talk to people. If you can't address it, it you know, I mean, there's a fundamental fatal flaw in what you're doing, you know, accept that and move on, you know, I mean, but if you believe you can address it, then go ahead. This is the main regulatory issue which you have. Yeah, yeah, thank you, okay, yeah. And so we have good data for this, actually, because uh, what we do is if we put these things into a cell, we sequence the closest sites, and we just, you know, we hammer on them and say, you know, we look at a thousand clones, did we have any mutations? And we haven't, so, you know, I, I think we're on the right path, but it's, you know, it will always be something we'll look at. Sure. Maybe, maybe you mentioned this, but I missed it, but the non-homologous end joining mm -hmm. being imperfect mm -hmm. is the basis for clearing the virus. That's correct. But that imperfection also leaves mutations in the normal genome uh, after the repair. Yes. So, th so it's in a site. In the, remember that the virus has inserted itself yeah. um, within the genome in, in all infected individuals at non-random sites. I mean, they're mostly in areas that are transcriptionally active, I and mean, there's a whole literature about where HIV integrates. So these things already have the virus in them. Um, and so, yes, what happens is you might have, you know, the virus is about 10 KB. At the end of this, what you'll have is about 9.5 KB <laughs> left, but it's lost critical elements of the virus that, you know, that would allow it to make progeny. Um, so you're still left with the insertion of the virus, where it went in. But also possible mutations around it, uh, which might affect the physiology of the cell. Um, no, all the mutations are within, are right at the, right at the cleavage site. We have really good data on this. They all contain the cleavage site. There's not mutation away from that surrounding. Right. Leaving uh, behind those bits of pro-virus, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't affect the physiology of the cell. Um, well, the cell's functional with the entire virus in it. So two arguments. One is that, the, you know, the, the virus, the cells are essentially functional with the provirus in them anyway. That's not thought to be, you know, the mechanism for cell loss in HIV. I mean, it's the active replication. Um, and the second thing is our genome is full of retroviral garbage. <laughs> it's a huge proportion. So in fact, you know, the argument that I like to make with my evolutionary friends is what we're trying to do is essentially speed up the process that is going to happen. I mean, if we look, you know, probably 100,000 years out, we will, you know, well, there may not be the selective pressure like there once was because of our medical abilities now, but um, what would happen, and if you look in the historical record, what has happened is these viruses have gotten in populations, they have selected for people who have innate resistance, 
Um, but you can eventually find retroviral stuff. I mean, you can find old, old retroviruses. My colleague Mike Emmerman, you know, does this and recreates these things and has really started to understand what evolutionarily allowed, you know, the, the primate lineage to restrict some of these different viruses because you can just find them. They're just sitting in there. So we're trying to speed that up and basically leave a shell of, of junk that you, you know, some future archaeologist is going to look back and say, wow, these are some strange mutations in these, you know, proviruses. It looks like somebody was trying to lop chunks out of this. You know, I, I don't know if they can really tell that, but, you know, you, I think you, you would see these things. Now, you know, for the most part, HIV is not in the germline and all that, but um, 45 million Indians might have hepatitis B structures in the chromosome. Yeah, right. A lot of integration from hepatitis B, I know. So, you know, that's a, we should talk about the hepatitis B issue. I'm actually very, very excited about that project. So, um, Keith, yeah. actually, to bring it back to mm -hmm. the workshop a little bit, yep. in terms of the structure in that way, you know, you, you propose what you're going to do in your activity too, mm -hmm. and then you actually say what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, and because that's like when you're reading it, that's the first thing you think about. It's like, well, that's kind of ambitious. Yeah, thank you. That like, wow. So you've actually, but you also then lead me through to say, well, why did you, mm -hmm. if it doesn't work? Yeah, do? thank you, because I actually probably would have missed mentioning that. And, and that's one thing about in, in any kind of grant writing. Try to foresee the pitfalls, what can go wrong, have a plan for getting around them, get that into your proposal so that people know you've thought about these things. I mean, that's, if, if you sit on the study section ever, this is, you'll see this, right? You know, this will be a critique on a grant that didn't do well. You know, the, the writer did not, you know, foresee difficulties, did not propose alternative approaches. It's just something, and you need to have a plan because you're trying to get from point A to point F out there, you know, what are gonna be my roadblocks along the way? Every activity that uh, there might be multiple risks. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we have to propose the, uh, propose how to take care of the risk associated with that activity. Mm -hmm. Like, if any point fall is there in an activity, like we expect something. You know, yeah, you know, uh, you have to take you know this looking for you know risks or pit, you know potential problems. You you can't write these things in, with a totally defi defensive you know, frame of mind, you can't write down in five pages everything that can go wrong, y you know, and, and it, I've done that, you know, I mean, believe me, by the, you know, after I was resubmitting some of these grants that I wasn't getting, it's like, God, I'm just thinking of every potential stupid, I mean, some of them were just stupid that a reviewer could come up with, and my trouble was they just didn't want to fund it because it wasn't important, <laughs> they were looking for stuff, but, you know, you need to find what are the critical things. You know, what are the really important, you need to spend some time thinking about that. What are the important pitfalls, you know, because you're going to have room to, 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 talk, to touch on maybe four, five, six, something like that of the big ones. Yeah, there might be 50 little, you know, 50 things that can go wrong, but what are the big ones? What are the smart people going to think about? <laughs> What's going to come in their mind first? Okay, right? And those are the ones you want to get. Okay. All right. So let's go down. Okay. So just a quick example again, you know, this is the what are you gonna do, how are you gonna do it, some, some real details, how many transformants are there. Um, we're gonna go through a, a selective iterative in vitro evolution of these things, basically to, to allow the homing endonuclease to become what we want. How long does that take? Well, you know, tell your reader how long does it take. It's gonna take between two and nine selections, rounds of selection. Now, that's a pretty wide range, right? Two and nine. This is based on, you know, what we've seen in the lab and some other things. But at least it says to the reader it's not infinite. You know, they're not gonna have to sit here and do this for five years. You know, two and nine rounds is, you know, roughly between, you know, Four, four weeks and four months. So it's, it's a doable sort of thing, okay? So just, you know, can you throw in those little details here and there to take things from the abstract to the concrete? That's gonna help your, your reviewer. Mm? Oh, yes. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, you've outlined the activities and numbered them very clearly. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular ideas on how you, one can go about summarizing 
uh, what would others be a very detailed and uh, lengthy uh, part of the proposal without losing the pertinent issues? <laughs> well, uh, yikes. I mean, you know, probably the, the first answer is that since you've been a, to ar able to articulate that question, you're 90% of the way there, that you realize that's what you need to do. So that's extremely hard. You know, you've got all this stuff you need to get across in a short amount of time. You can't get so much detail that they're lost. So I personally like to have a fairly strong topic sentence. You know, what am I trying to do in this paragraph? Again, this is the structure I like to put on it. So here, you know, this is my computational design part, okay? So in a computation, I'm trying to make a new enzyme. I'm gonna change it rationally using the computer. So I kind of go through this here, but at the very least, if they start to get lost at the end of this, they go, what was that? Oh, well, it was this, okay? Or, you know, uh, if I'm gonna uh, let them evolve and screen them in vitro, you know, here's all the stuff about that, but, you know, what am I trying to do? It's this, okay? So that's one thing about, you know, structure. You know, you can see I did it in bold, so it's real easy for my reader if they get lost. They're not, you know, all this detail. Well, what's the goal? The goal is this, and I can find it real easily because it's bold, okay? So I want them, gosh, if they lose track of what you're trying to do, you know, it's their fault, but it's your suffering, right? You know, it's like you, you got to make it easy for them. All right. So... Um, I want to just in the last, we only have about five minutes here left. I, so, th so we get th here through the end of, of how this whole thing's gonna, gonna work and then in, a, in this last activity, this is really sort of the money experiment. If through all these things, I make these new enzymes now, you know, I, I, I'm gonna change them into making these HIV specific ones. What do I do with them? What is the experiment? And I take these cells that are real human cells from real infected people and they contain real HIV and I treat them with these homing endonucleases and then how do I measure if it worked? I'm gonna culture them, look for viral replication. I'm gonna use multiple HEs together. I'm gonna to sequence them. I'm going to really see what do I have there, okay? So this is again, lay out your experiment. Now in objective two, I have a real debt of gratitude to the Gates Foundation because when I was identified as a potential awardee, they actually worked very carefully, extensively with me to focus my proposal on what they wanted. And this was very helpful to me because I was faced with a real problem when I was writing this. And this is if, I mentioned there are sort of two big questions. The one is the specificity thing, you know, so. You know, can you get it, all the different viruses you need and not get the human genome? And we had that very dull. The other huge question that comes up, if you really think about this working, is how do you get these things to the cells you need to? Yeah. Okay? <laughs> and this is an enormous problem for HIV, more so than some of the other viral infections that I talked about, because in HIV you have about a million latently infected memory T cells scattered throughout the body. Some are in the gut, some are in the lymph nodes, some are in the blood. How do you get them there? Now we had some ideas. We have some ideas. We now have some funding to follow these ideas. And we don't have a lot of data yet. We're just really getting started on the delivery issue. Um, and I had that in this grant because I, in sort of a defensive way, I said, my God, we've got to address this. But now I'm in a phase two proposal with a very speculative set of experiments that are probably more appropriate for phase one, quite frankly, uh, in, from a budgetary point of view and also just from their development. And the foundation actually, and I'm very grateful for this, said, you know what? We think it'd be really great if you really focused a little more on AIM-1 and making these proteins. And I'm very, very grateful for that because if you really think about where we're going to be left at the end of this, is that we'll be left with, we have a reagent that if we can get it into the right cell, can cure that cell of HIV. In other words, one of the two big problems has been solved. Okay, there are two problems, having the right reagent and getting it there. Okay, and the technology is really there for the making the reagent, I think. I truly believe this in my heart. We're not quite there for the delivery, but part of that is because nobody's ever had anything to deliver, right? Nobody's been working on this, okay? And so it was really brilliant of the foundation to say, 
just get us something that we'd want to deliver, and we'll deal with that later. Okay, and and I think science is an is an, you know science is an incremental thing. Okay, and that makes a much more coherent proposal. And so what we ended up doing is saying, why don't we take this design thing and move into a, an even bigger, more generalizable way of design that we won't go through in a lot of detail, but that's what objective two is. And this is now, instead of taking this one enzyme that you might have seen up here called y 2 any one all the time, now to actually expand and, and identify an entire family of enzymes where now instead of having to find you know, some close thing to this one sequence within HIV, we've got a huge family of these starting points and we're able to find sequences that are much, much closer to one of them. We can choose one of any one. So we built that into this, you know, the, the foundation loved that because it really um, could take this into a, a much more powerful thing where we could design these much more rapidly, um, come up with a, a whole family of them, you know, to, to deal with the genetic variability issues and so forth. Um, and so this was a very, very collaborative work um, uh, together with one of my colleagues who um, is, is in Seattle um, who was originally starting on this family. And so we've been working very closely to uh, build those out. Um, I want to show you this section, uh, Project Potential. Um, I took this, and you can take this with a grain, you know, take this for what you will. I felt like this was the place, again, to come up with a set of deliverables, deliverables for the foundation. So, I mean, they stressed that a little more in phase one, but I felt like we could do this here. What will we have at the end of this? Okay. So what we want to have is several HIV-specific homing endonucleases and sufficient data to show that they actually work on HIV-infected cells. And number two, we're going to have, you know, a, a tremendous number of, of even more with, with additional HIV sequences and now a pathway to really making a whole bunch of these things. So I want to say, what are the deliverables? So that it's very clear that at the end of this, we have a yes, this is still promising, or, you know, no, it's not, but we know, we know the fate of this project, okay? So I think having a deliverables, at least in your mind, is a very, very uh, useful approach to this. And then finally, if we get to the very, very end here, this is where I finally, and very, very late, and this was a mistake in this, very, very late, do we actually say why we're the right people to do this, okay? So what is it about, you know, the, the group in Seattle and, and my colleagues and myself? And it really is because we just happen to have all the right expertise to really bring this thing together and pull it off. Um, and, and here we really go through that, I think, much, much better and explain all the moving parts and how that, that would work. But I think I could have at least alluded to this a little better early up front uh, to bring the reviewer uh, in along with me. Okay? And that's sort of the end of it. So uh, we'll take a couple questions and then Is it the break. Is it the platers from the collaborators uh, has to be collected before applying for the project? Uh, are you asking if the letters should be before? Yeah. Um, in general, yes. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm trying to remember for this what the, I, the letter situation is, and I, I don't remember now. I mean, you'd have to look through the, you know, the request for proposal. But in general, for any sort of grant, yes. And really, I, I would encourage you to, you know, do that not only because it's required, but because you need to be talking to those people to make sure you're doing this thing right. You know, I mean, you know, when I write these things, then I send them to people. I say, does this make sense? You know, have I, it, it, am I understanding what we're doing here right? And it's not because I don't think I do. I always think I do. But every once in a while, I've made a mistake, you know. And, and I want to know that, right, before we get started or try to do something that's impossible. Actually, for the first, first grand challenge, base grand challenge program, most of the developing country projects fail because they didn't have appropriate collaborators. They were individual projects yeah. with individual capabilities, but collaborators were lacking. Yeah, okay, that's great. The yeah. second stage is once we got the budget later, then uh, the thing comes like if something comes up, like the IPR issues and all has to be taken care of before, or like it has to be settled and talked across before putting the application. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's, that's pain. I mean, from the time that I got word that I was going to get this till we actually started was, I think, seven months. And it was stuff like that. 
And a quick note on the collaborators. Um, formal letters you don't need at the time of your application, but should your project be selected, it's something that we would do. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I couldn't remember. Yeah. And actually, an, addition, oh, an additional point to what your, uh, Dr. Gangolia mentioned was that, I mean, that, that's one of the reasons we've had developing country, so quite a few proposals not make it. But actually, more importantly, is actually the structure and what Keith was talking about in that first page. If you, if you can't lay it out, that first half a page or two thirds of a page, in a way that people can really grasp, oh, that's something that stood out for us. It's something which is why working with GCC as a partner, it was a great thing to, to work on. And not just for this proposal. Yes, you have a deadline for this particular proposal. But it's actually more of a structure that you can use going forward in additional grants that you'll also Uh, yeah. You mentioned that, uh, I mean, the structure of the phase two application is that you have capabilities right at the end. But mm -hmm. are you saying that just a few sentences in the early part of the would help? I, mean, I think so. I mean, in retrospect, looking at this, I think it would have been. I think it, it all goes into this early on. You want to get them, your your reviewers, to believing in this project. And, and, and I think I ran the risk of not having achieved that. I think I got away with it. I mean, quite frankly, you know, you know, these, these are some well-known institutions, right? You know, and, and I can get away with that. I mean, the, nobody, people will generally give me the benefit of the doubt because I'm at the Fred Hutchinson, you know, and I'm at the University of Washington and, you know, I'm in children, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, that's the grand eye, that's us. But, um, you know, I think especially if, it, Never, never allow any weakness into your proposal. If you can identify it, fix it. You know, and I would say, you know, this is one I was just blinded to seeing at the time. I mean, you know, you look at these things constantly for months, right? You, you become blinded to some of the weaknesses in them, and that's why it's important to show them to people whose judgment you trust. But to, I guess, to add to that point too, though, but well, we wouldn't have gotten to the point of reading about that you were at the Fred Hutch had we not wanted to read the first. Patient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So, so you had to win them over about yeah. the concept of where you're going, what yeah. your idea was. That's a nice piece after the fact. But if you can't convince them on the first yeah. two thirds yeah. of the page, it doesn't matter yeah. where you're from. Right. Right. I, I just do think that there were some places a little earlier on that that's that some of the that the collaborations could have been stressed better. That's all. Thank you very much, Keith. Yeah. So in the interest of time, what we thought we could do is actually have a fifteen minute break now. And, it, and realize you had a chance to kind of look over the proposal. Keith kind of gave you a great kind of overview of it. Yeah. If you want us to take a chance to scan it and everything. And what we'll do 15 minutes from now is have to do a, a question and answer. And we can start to have more of an engaged dialogue. About yeah, it. please. It gives you a chance. You've heard some of the key points. Start to formulate the questions you have. We can have the dialogue. So about 15 minutes from now. Thanks.